just do me a favor, Antioch, and um, help me acknowledge uh, the gifts that you have in this house. God has placed two angels to watch over you. They serve you in the word. They serve you in worship. They care so much about your family. And so since I even hear the conversations that you don't, I can affirm for you, they really love you a lot. Can you please stand on your feet and celebrate these two incredible gifts? Pastor Wayne and Maisha Cheney. This your pastor. Come on. Come on. Let me. Your first lady. Um, come on, West Coast. Praise God. Oh, I love them so much. And real quick, could you just holler at my boo over there? I'm traveling with my wife, Terry. Wait, wait a minute. Y'all don't even know why you're hollering at her yet. That's my high school boo. No, I'm just messing with you. That's my grammar school boo. I'm married 22 years, but I've known her uh, almost as long as I've known my sisters, and I um, still think she's fine and pretty and all that kind of stuff. And she ride or die. She's so ride or die, she's doing three services today. <laughs> Try to sit at home, and she's like, no, I'm staying with my man. <laughs> Praise God. I, you, your pastor is so prophetic and ridiculous that you ought to know that when he mentioned the Lord moving on him and he, he called me, I confirmed in the spirit that I, I was hearing and sensing the same thing in the atmosphere. Um, I don't know if you guys are watching the signs of the times you're reading tea leaves. Uh, there's a day coming. There's a, there's a, there's a divide happening economic divide of great means and uh, we are moving quickly towards a day where few people will have a lot and a lot of people will have little and this is not about race or religion or gender this is simply about haves and have nots and I thank God that that your pastor would um, be so tuned into God that he would bring me in to share with you the word of God in an area that often churches don't always go as deep in in terms of how we build wealth. Because the good news is God wants us to be blessed, and I'm so glad about it, aren't you? I mean, I'm so glad that, I mean, some of y'all, you know, you may be holier than me, and, you know, you, you want to suffer with him to be like him. I thank God that uh, I, I could be, we can be theological and full of faith and, and, and still have coffers of wealth. But what I'm here to do today is to help you discover the purpose for it. And if, if I would really categorize what we're trying to do today is to, I'm not here to talk to you about uh, things to do. A list of seven this and three that or invest in this or save for that. I accumulate that kind of conversation for another medium, not today. Today, I want to work with your heart. Because when you discover the true purpose for why God wants to bless you, your heart will shift. And actions and behaviors don't shift unless the heart shifts first. Amen? Amen? You know what to do. You, you read the books. You know how to save. You're not a budget. You're not to invest. You, 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 you got that. But what I, I, I sense God wants to do today is something with our hearts and move it. And, 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 and you can just grab your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45, but put a pin in that. We're going to get there in a second. There's a reason why I'm starting this way because um, Jesus kind of messed me up. You know, anybody have Jesus just, you read a text and he just kind of mess you up. It's kind of like, like, Jesus, really, why are you going here like this? And in Matthew 6 and 24, you guys may know this. Jesus says, he like has a very direct and blunt conversation with his disciples. He says, no one can serve two masters. No one, no one. So if you're going to follow me and you're going to do it my way, I got a way. I, I, I'm putting this on the table right now. You can't do it two ways got to pick one. He says, he says, either you'll hate one and you'll love the other. You'll despise one and or to be devoted to the other. And then watch how he summarizes this. 
I love it. He says, you can't serve. And I, I pause here because every time I read this text, I got to remind myself of the contrast he's making here. He says, you can't serve God in money. I did not see that coming. It, it would seem to me that the logic of the text would have progressed. Maybe the master would be the master of this universe or the master of the earth or the the, the, the angel fallen who deceives men on the earth or my flesh. I can't serve my flesh uh, and God. Notice the contrast is none of those things. You can't serve God and money. And the beauty is he didn't say you can't have God and money. Well, y'all to be blessing God right now on that one. Get an amen in that one. He just said you can't serve God in money. So in other words, 2,000 years ago, Jesus gives this challenge, and it's relevant to us today. If I might paraphrase it into colloquial language, it's almost like Jesus is saying, show me your bank account and your credit card statements, and I'll show you who you really love. I hope that didn't bother you too much. I don't say that to criticize you. Hear my heart. I'm the guy Jesus is talking to. I filed bankruptcy at 21 years old. 20, I'm not talking, I'm, you know, I was in sin, I was morally bankrupt. No, I was in church. Watch this. I was a 21-year-old bankrupt believer. Papers filed. You go to bankruptcy court, they list all your assets out in public. They list all your liabilities out in public. Then the judge has to give this statement of net worth where they read out all your business in front of people. And they say, assets are X dollars, which in my case was pretty much zero. You know, I, I, don't, I think I borrowed the bus money to get to the court that day. So I'm not sure if they counted the change from the ticket, but that's all I had. On the other side at 21 years old was a mountain of credit card debts, loans, and everything, car notes. Just looked at me, guys, he said, for those of you watching this and stream, you, I want you to come in with this too. And he says, you're worth less than zero. It was almost like financially my life was ruined before it even began and I was only 21 years old. So some of you sitting here today, you might be thinking, well, it's too soon for me to start planning long term and thinking about things. And I'm telling you, no, it's not. Some of you might say, well, I'm, uh, it's too late for me to start planning and making changes and thinking about things. I'm telling you, no, it's not. Some of you might feel like you're already on the way. Well, I'm doing some things. I'm telling you, you can never do enough. Take it from somebody who was formerly bankrupt at 21 years old. Because I serve a great big God, and there's another side to the story. Here's what happened. Heard all the good preaching. Knew about tithing, knew about giving, knew about the spirit of generosity. I didn't understand stewardship. So I didn't know how to practice wealth principles. I prayed and I asked God to do something to me and God moved my heart. I'm telling you, I felt the presence of God in my heart. Everything about my life changed when God revealed to me there's a long-term purpose to why you're here. And I'm gonna show you in the text where he revealed to me and share with you today. And here's the good news. When I received the word of the Lord in my life, my heart changed, my behaviors changed. I'm telling you, my career began to take off. So much so that in, in corporate America, I was once at one time one of the 40 under 40 top executives in the country. God took me from that in corporate America, moved me into my own businesses. I became the, a prolific entrepreneur. And in less than 10 years, I went from being less than uh, zero dollars to a net worth well in excess of a million dollars. Won't he do it? Oh, come on. I'm not bragging, but I just need you to give God some praise. And I'm not boasting, but I'm boasting in the Lord. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. God is so good. And he went and he took me from just starting a business to investing in the dreams of others. And, and, and God has blessed me that my net worth now, I, I, I wish I could see the judge that told me I was worth less than zero. I'd show him my portfolio of companies and assets and let him know I'm so far from zero. My God is so big. God bless you. Let me sow a seed into your life. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God. Not where you start, but where you finish. Okay, somebody give God praise in this house.
Watch this, watch this, watch this. All right, so look at Genesis 45. We got we to gotta get Because I'm here to talk to you through the lens of Joseph. And what I want you to see uh, is the heart of God for the purpose of your wealth and what he wants you to do and how he wants you to do it. And I want to walk you through this text through the lens of Joseph. And, I, and my question is simple. I can't answer the question. Only you can. But my question is very simple, and I'm going to ask it after reading this text. Genesis 45, verse 4 through 8 in the NIV. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come, he said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into G to Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. For the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me father to Pharaoh and Lord of his entire household and the ruler of all Egypt. I want you to really draw your eyes on that verse 7. Joseph declares, but God sent me. God. Everything I've been through, I'm not, I'm not mad about it. I'm not mad. I've been through pits, been through prisons, I've been in Potiphar's house. I have... I've had ups and downs. I, I could look at my life and look at all the turmoil, the struggle, and everything I've been through. But I don't blame anybody because you know what? God, the hand of God is on my life, and I'm here for a divine appointed moment. I was born at the right time. I, I, I'm not here by accident. God sent me, and watch this, ahead of you. So I had to be born so that some others born after me, some others uh, born with me might benefit from me. The hand of God has given me a divine redemptive purpose to exist. And that divine redemptive purpose, uh, he says, is to preserve for you. My life is for you. Preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save you. From a recession to save you from economic collapse and turmoil. To save you from our family name being wiped from the slate to exist no more. To save you from poverty. To save you from struggle. Everything about my life is divinely pointed by God for you. I just have a simple question for you today, Antioch, that only you can answer. Are you the one? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor... Are you the one? Turn to somebody else and say, are you the Joseph for your family? Are you the one with divine redemptive purpose that you've discovered that you want to tap into today to save some future life? And for you to say yes to that, you're going to have to make a shift out of survival mode and begin to make a shift towards God. And God is not a short term God. He's long term. We think about the short game, but God thinks about the long game. In other words, what I'm saying is you might be sitting here today concerned about survival, but God is concerned about your survivors. Are you tracking with me? I get it. I get it. You, 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 you got to live for today. You have rent to pay today. You have bills due today. You have a mortgage due today. You have health care deductibles to meet today. And, and, and with so much coming at us financially, it can make us live no matter how much we have in survival mode. I know folks living in multi-million dollar homes still in survival mode. Because if the interest rate is adjusted when it goes up by 1%, they can lose the home. So it's not about what we have on the outside. It's about moving towards uh, understanding the heart of God. And I'm just, I just want you to wrestle and just begin to ask yourself, even as I'm teaching this text, are you the one? Are you the one that God wants to use to, to set up and leave behind something great in two dimensions? There's two dimensions to what you're to leave behind. There's the kingdom dimension. 
The existence of Joseph was tied to the continuation of the work of the Lord through the peoples of God. So there's the kingdom reason why I want to leave something behind so that the work goes on. But then there's the second dimension. There is my family. There are those that I'm peeking into the future to understand and design for them a life. Joseph says, God put me here because God is concerned. I need you to understand something about the Lord. When you read the Old Testament, you see a lot of phrases like this. Let me give you a peek into the heart of God. Let me paint a picture for you. You see terms like from generation to generation. You, you, see, you, you, see, you, you see terms, uh, you see lineage outlined. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. In fact, um, I don't even know what Joseph's last name is, but I do know he's the great-grandson of Abraham, that he's the grandson of Isaac, that he's the son of Jacob. I don't know what his last name is, but I do know that I might be able to define him because his name is important to God, just as your name is important to God. And I believe the definition that a Joseph-like person has is in this text. And I'm hoping spiritually you might tap in and adapt this name for your whole shift in your heart to see what God wants you to see for your future generations. Joseph said, God sent me ahead to preserve you. So in the old days, you would name somebody by where they were from or what they did. If we name Joseph by what he did, he's a preserver. So we might call him Joseph the preserver. Do you know what a preserve does or a preservative does? A preservative is something that you use to extend the life of something else. It it gives it shelf life, right? If you have fruit and you, you add preservatives, you add preservatives so that it lasts a long time. Somebody say last a long time. God wants you to think about your life in a way that you're making decisions so that whatever you have, it lasts a long time. I have any Josephs in the room today who are starting to hear the call of God on their redemptive purposes. Watch this. Joseph says, I am a preservative. I'm a preservative for you. And he says, because the Lord has sent me ahead to preserve you so that there might be a remnant. Now, here's this word in the Hebrew. I love, I love God's word. In the Hebrew, the word for remnant is the Hebrew word shereth. And it means, and it means, it means to be left over. So let me repaint the text for you. Joseph says, everything I've been through in my life, God is using me as a preservative for the leftovers. Are you following me? I. I'm a preservative because there's some folk coming behind me that they can't live the life God wants them to live unless I'm the preservative that extends their shelf life. Oh, God, are you, are you, guys, are you, are you guys seeing this? Are you, uh, eat, watch this. I'm, I come, I'm a foodie. 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 Any foodies in the house? People that love food, love food. Like, no, no, seriously, y'all too holy now. Like, who really love food? This is... Pastor, you my, this is the very secular part of the sermon. This is all, who love, for real, uh, don't raise your hand if you're not going to take me to someplace good to eat now. Who love food? Okay. Who come from food family? Your whole family negotiate the whole culture around the table? That's, well, that's me. Okay, okay, that's me. I come from a family of seven, five brothers and sisters. And we were saved, but we certainly fought for food. We put food out. So listen, we did Thanksgiving big. Whether we had little or a lot, somehow we find a way to scrape up enough to have at least three to five meats for Thanksgiving, right? Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, I know it's not the greatest sound financial advice, but it did taste good. I'm just... Now watch this, watch this, watch this. So if you're a foodie, you know that when you cook food, it doesn't taste its best the first day you cook it. Oh, come on. I, I, am I talking to anybody in this house? I don't know. This section over here, I'm not sure they understand. What about the middle, y'all? It tastes better the next day, right? Because the, cause those are called what? The leftover. Ah. Now, have you, ever, have you ever gotten your mouth all watered up? Hungry. 
almost can paint a picture like the dude uh, you know, with a paintbrush. You can, you can paint the picture of the, of the cherry pie or the turkey in the gravy or the, or, you know, the candy jams or whatever your favorite is, the cobbler you were going to eat. And you were just all day, you're like, I can't wait to get home. Man, I'm going to eat me some leftovers, right? Right? Have you ever gone in the refrigerator with a taste for something particular and you opened the door only to find out that there was no more left? You scream the same thing we all scream through the house. Who ate the? <laughs> You're about to get it, Antioch. I don't want your future generations to look in the refrigerator of life, open it up, and ask who ate all the leftovers. Oh, can I talk to you for a minute? Who spent all the money? Who, who rode all the cars so that, so that uh, there'd be nothing left? There, and there, no, no retirement, no investment. I don't want your future generation to open the refrigerator of life and say, who lived in a house too big and I got to live in one too small? Uh, who, who, who spent so much that I can't get a college education? Who ate all the leftovers? Who, who wore the nicest clothes and now I got to wear rags? Who ate all the leftovers? Uh, and you know how it feels. It, you, you're mad when somebody eats the leftovers. Joseph says, Joseph says, watch this. I'm a preservative so that there be some leftovers. The leftovers have another component, right? Because it's not just enough to have the leftovers. That's why that word preserve is so important. It's in the strategic decision-making as to how we make sure they last long enough, right? Because in my day, we, we to preserve a leftover, I mean, I don't know how you do. Some of y'all may just take food and just throw it in the refrigerator with nothing on it, right? That's, you know, some, some of y'all don't like that, amen. <laughs> this just over here, like, I'm not, you don't do it in my house, and I'm with you, amen. And in my day, we used something called a loop. I'm, I'm over 40, I'll just say that. I'm going to tell you how far. But in my day, we used aluminum foil. So everything you wrapped. Why? Because it was a preservative. It would allow the food to last longer. Today, they use like press and seal, you know, fancier product so you can see. See, in our day, we just had to open all the aluminum foil and see what was in there. <laughs> Today, you just look on the outside, you have press and seal. But either way, the goal is not just to put something in the fridge, but to preserve it so we can keep eating it as much as we want to, as long as we want to. If I got somebody in this house today that's hearing what I'm saying, you ought to give God some praise and say, I hear you, God. I hear you, God. Can I mess with you just for a second? Just for a second, some practicals. Here's an easy way to put leftovers in the refrigerator. If you have cable, direct TV, whatever all the streaming options are, that stuff probably costs somewhere near $70 if you add it all up. You want to leave some leftovers? Cut it off. Go back to over-the-air antenna. <laughs> they say the signal's HD. It might look good. I don't know. I'm not doing it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying if you want to do it, Pastor, <laughs> I need Hulu. <laughs> but if you want to do it. You put away $70 a month in that whole refrigerator of your life, you leave leftovers of $92,000. Just for $70 a month. It only take 25 years to do that. I got another one for you. If you, take, if you take $211 a month for one year, you start a Roth IRA. You can, you can, you can build a retirement fund and maybe have some leftovers out of that. And if you only put that $5,000 aside and leave it alone for 25 years and don't touch it, you'll probably end up with over $60,000. That's a lot of leftovers. Could you imagine if you woke up in the morning into the, the beautiful light of earth and you were a baby and somebody told you, God bless you, baby. Your name is John and you have $60,000. I bless God for that. And what if you could put away $5,500 a year for 25 years in that same IRA? You leave somebody over $600,000 in leftovers. Can I get an amen for $600,000? Amen. I need you to shift your heart and mind so that there can be some leftovers for your family. Why? Because it's the will of God. Joseph said, God sent me ahead as a preservative so there'll be some leftovers 
for somebody coming behind. Now watch this. There can't be leftovers or survivors. There can't be survivors. There can't be survivors. We want, we, we, we want to move from survival mode because God cares about survivors, but there can't be survivors without an inheritance. Somebody shout out inheritance. In other words, God wants you to live well. We're not arguing that today. But he wants you to live well within margin. In other words, your life can't go so fast and so above and beyond your means that there's nothing left over. Now, can I show you this in a text real quick? Genesis 1.28. So when Terry and I were married, when Terry and I were married, there was a mother of the church. Her name was Mother Sarah Range. Mother Sarah Range taught me this text. She said to me, she said, baby, y'all going to make some cute babies. I was like, okay, mother, thank you. Appreciate that. She said, be fruitful and multiply. I was like, okay. Okay, all right. Well, we, we still broke, but we'll try it. She said, be fruitful and multiply. Now watch this. From that conversation with Mother Range, my understanding grew. She planted the seed for me to see this text in a different light. The text says, be fruitful and multiply, then fill the earth. Which means the text is broader than just baby making. It has to do with the way God wants things to happen in his earth. It has to do with the architecture of how God wants us to fill the earth. Why? He gives us the methodology for filling and bringing the earth into the abundance and the, and the dominion that he wants. It's by multiplication and fruitfulness, which means the text is in both progressive and successive order. And the revelation is almost like this. First, be fruitful. Somebody say fruitful. Second, then multiply. Somebody say multiply. Third, then fill. Right? So in other words, what it looks like is this. Um, one cannot fill unless one multiplies. And one cannot multiply unless one has something to multiply by. And the multiply by is fruitfulness. Uh, let me help you with this so I don't lose you here. Uh, in other words, I cannot fill the earth if what I multiply by is lack. Oh, you're missing me. Because y'all know math. I wasn't good at it, but I, I got this much uh, down. Uh, what is lack times lack? You know, more lack. <laughs> y'all talking about lack? No, lack is lack. Lack times lack is more lack. <laughs> and if you don't want more lack, don't expand your life before it's time. Ah. Uh, some of you are business owners in here, and you, you, I'm, I'm talking you out of that second location to the first location is extremely profitable. Because you, the Lord says the, 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 the way you tap into the architecture of God is to be fruitful first, bring something to maturity. See, fruitfulness is a word for maturity. Bring your life to economic maturity and then expand, then multiply, and from that you can feel. Is this blessing anybody in the room today? Why? Why does God put that in the first chapter of the first book of the Word of God? Because it was always his heart that we live in abundance, and he gave us the formula for doing it. Be fruitful first. Somebody say, be fruitful. But we can't be fruitful if we eat up all the fruit. We eat up all the fruit. Could you imagine? I mean, if, 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 if you know, we, we, we read the text like there was only one apple. We only, the Bible didn't even say it was an apple. That's all the pictures. The Bible just said it was fruit. But how in the world are you going to feed a family if you eat the only piece of fruit you have? There's not nothing to leave behind. So what God has given a picture of is taking the seeds from that fruit and planting more trees. Waiting until those trees mature and grow into fruitfulness. When they become fruitful now, you've multiplied, you have an orchard full of trees, and you have plenty of resources, and now the garden is filled with everything you need. If you're hearing me today, lift your hands to the Lord and say, Lord, teach me to fill. Make me fruitful. Oh, I give God praise for you. Watch this. So let me relate to you another way, right? Because, you know, that's, that's all biblical, right? But there's, a, there's these extra biblical sources that sometimes we can consult when trying to get revelation on the word and um this one is from the book of jay-z <laughs> and uh from the chapter called the story of oj uh, this is the chapter of oj verse one uh, don't worry I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit the lyrics <laughs> jay-z says 
I brought some artwork for one million. Two years later, it's worth two million. A few years later, it was worth eight million. I can't wait to leave this stuff to my children. Are you seeing it? It's not about right now. Watch this. I'm about to give you a text that I'm about to shout on myself. If you don't shout, I don't need you to shout. I'm going to shout because I love this text because this text tells me about the goodness of my God and how he cares about me. He cares about you. And I know you're going to get excited about this because this proves to me that God is no respecter of persons. This proves to me it's not how much I have in order for God to bless me. This proves to me that God doesn't exclude me from certain things based upon my title, based upon my executive status, based upon the zip code I grew up in, based upon what I was born to or without. I love this text. Are you ready for this text? Here you go. Proverbs 13, 22. Says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man. Oh, my God. This is God talking here. God says you can make me smile by how you handle your affairs financially And if you handle them in a way that you're thinking long term and that no matter how young or how old you are, you're consistently thinking about everything you do in the nature of how this will affect tomorrow, God says, that's a good man. That's a good woman. That's a good person. A good person leaves, watch this, not that they're always able to, but they have in this text, they got to have the heart to do it. Whether, whether you end up doing it or not, I'm asking you to shift your heart to want to leave it behind. I don't care if you're here today and you're starting with nothing. You, I want your heart to shift to the abundance to say, I want God to smile and the label I want God to give me. When God describes me to his friends in heaven, I want God to look at his friends in heaven, gather all the angels around and say, you know what? That's a good dude right there. Says, and watch this. The text actually continues and says, and that person won't be surprised by death. They're not afraid of death. Why? Because they know their name going on. The legacy will continue. Antioch, I got to ask the question again. Are you the one? I don't know who I'm talking to today. But if I am, you're starting to hear. You're starting to hear me loud and you hear the resonance of God. The heartbeat of God is coming alive in you to say, I've been playing this game wrong the whole time. I've been living in survival mode and God is thinking about my survivors, but I can't have survivors unless I build an inheritance. I got to stop living for right now. I got to start living for tomorrow because I want to be the blessed of God and I believe it and I'm going to do it. You're hearing it. I got to get ready to go, but here it is. Here it is. For you to make that heart shift, you got to make a sacrifice if you want to leave an inheritance. Somebody say sacrifice. Uh, Sacrifice. A kingdom sacrifice. A family sacrifice. This church has been in this community for a long time. We share a spiritual lineage of having forerunners in our family. I don't think that Antioch is supposed to expire when Pastor Cheney expires. I believe the work here is so important and influential and what's happening in your very uh, unusual anointing that nobody else can flow in but you. That's got to be financed. And I'm hoping that even in this word, some of you would open up your hearts and your estate planning from here to make sure that uh, I check box A, I am going to leave some behind for the kingdom. So that the church can roll on. But, but also, I'm going to leave the mark on my children and my children's children so that they understand the importance of the work of the Lord and they'll have no excuse because I'm going to leave them blessed. Are you tracking with me? But if you don't do anything else and you don't listen to anything else today, I'm about to give you one simple reason you should make a sacrifice to leave an inheritance right now. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to laugh at me. It's almost going to be comical. Because you're going to look at me and go, this dude flew 3,000 miles. Had me hanging on the tip of his words. Like, I'm waiting. I'm like, what is he going to say? He built it up all big. Like, I got one thing for you. Drew my attention in. He's going to say something so simple. But I believe when I say it, you're going to understand why I need to remind you of this simple truth 
to this application of our finances and our wealth. Here's the simple reason you should strive to leave a legacy, leave an inheritance for your family, leave an inheritance for the kingdom of God. It's simple because that's what Jesus has done for us. Okay, let me show you. Let me show you. Okay. Um, who in here went on vacation and got on a cross for somebody else? Nobody. Who was pierced in their side? Nobody. Who went to their own and their own received them not? Nobody. Who emptied themselves of their glory so that they could walk among us and become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God? Nobody in here. Watch this. I'm going to show you. You got an inheritance. You got to do it because Jesus did it because we want to be like him. Ephesians 1.11 says, in him we also have obtained an inheritance. That's what it says. And inheritance means you just, you get it. You didn't work for it. Salvation is an inheritance. You're going to get heaven and everything that comes with it. You didn't do any of the work. All you have to do is, like anybody else with inheritance, thank you, I appreciate this. That's all salvation is. Thank you, I appreciate this. You get, you get an inheritance. And watch this. I love it. I love it. I love it. Watch this verse in, in the message. Here it is. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and our purpose for living, what we're living for. Because long before we first heard of Christ and even got our hopes up, oh, God, I love your word. He had his eye on us. Oh, God, I love your word. He didn't stop there. He didn't just peek into the future and see you and me here at Antioch Church on this Sunday morning. But when he put his eye on us, he then put a plan in place and designed for us a life that is glorious. Do you see what, see what Jesus did? The inheritance we have of salvation, he put his eye on us. And he didn't just think about us. He then put a plan in place and designed for us the most beautiful life. If I could just get you to do what Jesus did. Oh, your family will be just as blessed as you are for knowing Jesus because they knew you. In other words, let me ask you a question. Who do you have your eye on? Who can you see? Can I tell you the truth about my bankruptcy prayer? How I went from zero to millions, you know it shifted. Before that prayer, I saw nobody but myself. I was bankrupt because I saw me. I saw my life, my lifestyle, my treat yourself moments, what I deserve, all I've been through. Well, nobody couldn't tell me nothing. I fought for everything I had and nobody was going to take it from me. Well, nobody, no apology for how I'm going to live. I just saw me. But I was engaged to this beautiful woman over here. And in that prayer, when that man said I was left to nothing, I just kept hearing that ring in my ear, and I was on my knees. And here's what happened. God put my eye on them. I began to see my children. And I didn't want to be a bankrupt believer and raise my children in that. I wanted them to have the best that God offered. I wanted my life to be a living testimony to them. And my heart shifted and I changed. When God put my eye on somebody other than myself, made all my decisions easier, who, Antioch, do you have your eye on? And what are you willing to sacrifice to design for them as Jesus has done for us? A glorious living. You may not get to achieve everything you wanted to in your life and live the way you want, but if God put your eye on somebody, your heart will want to see them living everything you could not. Can I get somebody to bless God in this place? Watch this. All right, we got to go. We're going to pray. But so many people play the Powerball and Mega Millions. I'm not mad at them. I'm not mad at them. But you know why they do it? It's a bit of escapism. Because it allows us to have a cheat code for what we didn't do. Yeah. To, to get the house that we didn't save rightly for so we can get it quick. To 
going to vacation that we don't want to put money aside for over a long time and add it to our bucket list so we can get it quick. Watch this. And to make up for what we didn't do to leave something behind, that we can, now we can get it quick and we can finally leave something behind for our family. But if you understand who, what Joseph's saying, if you understand that God is sending some of you ahead, that you are here for purpose, your divine redemptive purpose, part of it is for you to leave behind an inheritance for the kingdom and for your family, then you will understand this simple truth. You don't need to play Powerball or Mega, Mega, Mega Millions. You are the winning ticket. Look at your name and say, you are the winning ticket. When your family got you, they got everything they need. Everything they need in you. I want to give you a chance to respond to the word. Here it is. Because God's about to destroy something right now that the enemy thought was a stronghold. But he's fooled right now. Because the light of the gospel has shone forth in our hearts. Here it is. I want to pray for the person who know they came in here today. They didn't have an eye on anybody yet. They didn't have a full plan in place. And even if they did, they had not started taking the steps to, to, to think about and leaving anything behind in inheritance. And I want to pray with you, and I want you to stand boldly. I don't want you to let the enemy fool you and trick you, because the enemy will try to keep us down and not remember uh, what God has for us. If that's you, I want you to stand. If, if, if it's you and you've already started to make a plan, but now you see a Proverbs 13, 22. Maybe you plan for your children, but not your children's children, and you're like, I see the heart of God. Wait a minute, I thought I was doing well enough, but I got to go another generation deep. I got to move my heart another generation deep. If you see yourself in this word and you are the Joseph for your family no doubt about it you received the call of God on your life and you are going to make the sacrifices because they will look to you like they look to Abraham and say my name is great because God moved in their lives if that's you would you lift your hands with me and here's what we're going to do to shake the devil that's so radical after I pray and I say amen I just want you all over the building if that's you and you receive this prayer I just want you to shout out and finally answer that question and say, I am the one. And we're going to shout it out loud until heaven rings and Satan flees and removes himself from every bit of our lives. We give you praise and glory and honor, God. Lord God, we thank you right now for the spirit of abundance is on this house and is from your heart. We receive your heart right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for performing surgery on us right now. We have shifted ourselves from the atmosphere of just looking at today and we receive, God, that new dimension of seeing tomorrow. It's tomorrow. God, you plan not from our beginning to our end. You work with us from our end back to our beginning. God, you see what's going down and you have moved us now to tap into that grace that you have on us to see our future. We declare it right now. Lord, we receive your abundance. Lord, we receive your favor. And we ask you right now to give us the power and strength. Holy Spirit, speak to us in our budgeting. Speak to us in our saving. Speak to us in our investing. Speak to us in our estate planning. We yield right now. We yield. We yield the car. We yield the house. We yield the clothes. We yield the handbags. We yield the watches. We yield everything else to your will that we have abundance and we leave something behind. We believe it now and we declare this in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody shout out, I am the one if you are the one. Shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. Let heaven ring. I am the one.